Hi everyone. My name is Swapnil Shet. Swap is easier all around. Uh, so I'll present two programs. I'm the program director for CIS MSc, but I'm pretty familiar with MCIT as well. So I'll talk about both of them. Uh, so let's get started. So what is CIS MSc? So this is what I would think of as a traditional like masters in CS program. So for this program, we assume that you have a background in computer science of some sort. So it doesn't have to be specifically a bachelor's in computer science, but computer engineering, electrical engineering, something closely affiliated. So if you've done courses on programming languages, data structures, algorithms, operating systems, for example, that will be a good fit in terms of background for the CIS MSc program. So if you are admitted to this program, you can pursue interests in a variety of areas. So we have about like 50 to 60 faculty in the department from a wide variety of areas, including of course, like AI and machine learning, databases, programming languages, theory, robotics, security, and so on. Uh, for the program, the core requirements are on the slide that you see, I just briefly mentioned them. So you need to take four core classes. One of them has to be a theory class. So that's either algorithms or theory of computation. One has to be a systems class. So that's, we have a bunch of options there. So things like operating systems, network systems, internet and web systems. You can take a machine learning class if you'd like. And there are other core classes such as computer architecture and software foundations. In addition to this, you have to take three CIS electives. So these can be any grad courses. So for us, grad courses are 5,000 and above. So you can take any 5,000 to 7,000 courses uh, towards your degree requirements. And then you're allowed to take an additional three CS or approved non-CS electives. So we know, for example, that Penn has very strong departments, both in engineering and outside of engineering. So we want to make it possible for you to take classes, for example, in electrical engineering. Like we have a lot of our students take IPD courses, for example, as they are interested. You can take classes in the business school. You can take classes in the college, for example. So we'll allow that if you're interested. So that's the CIS MSc program. Uh, I'll briefly introduce this MCIT program and then also talk about a few other things. So what is MCIT? So MCIT is a master's in computer science for those who don't have an undergrad in computer science. So generally, I guess, historically, we've had people who've done other kinds of engineering, for example, like material science or mechanical engineering and so on. We've had people who've been music majors, art history majors, journalism majors, et cetera. And the way this program is structured is the first year is accelerated. So what you would have learned in two, three years of an undergrad gets compressed into one year in the master's and you have six core classes. I'll get into that in a second. And then the second year, you'll take grad classes with the rest of the department. So in your first year, we'll teach you essentially all the core fundamentals of computer science. So you'll end up learning things like software development, uh, discrete math, computer systems. And then in your second semester, you'll learn data structures and algorithms, software design, a uh, little bit of algorithms and computer systems programming. And then, as I said, you'll take grad courses with the rest of the department uh, in your second year. So in terms of a full-time and part-time study, it depends on whether you are a domestic or a, an international student. So if you're an international student, you have to be full-time. So that means taking three courses per semester. So the typical course load that people will do is three and three courses in your first year, three courses in the fall, and then one course in your last spring. If you're a domestic student, you can be part-time if you choose, and it's completely your choice. In terms of, and yeah, I see there are a bunch of questions in chat. I'll get to that like in a few minutes. Uh, in terms of admissions, generally, uh, we are looking at things holistically because we know that all of you have very, very different backgrounds. So we are looking at things like your background, for example, in terms of classes you've taken and grades you've gotten, things like a personal statement, things like a letter of recommendation, your resume, if you have like work experience or any external experience. And similar to a lot of the other programs, GRE scores are optional. So if you've taken the GRE, you're welcome to include it, but you don't have to. In terms of numbers, here's roughly what uh, CIS, MSc, and MCIT looks like. So we have roughly about 100 people joining the program like every year. We have a bunch of accelerated masters. So that's people who are doing an undergrad plus masters combined. And then we have some dual degree students who start in one program and add a dual degree to the other program. And you can see the numbers on the slides here. How do students connect? So I think one of the advantages that we have, uh, especially sort of post-COVID, is sort of 
re-evaluating what does it mean to be on campus and what are the benefits of doing things in person so we have a lot of things that you can do in person so a lot of things such as there's more opportunities for one-on-one -on -one mentoring in person we try to do like social events roughly like once a month where we'll get like industry talks like alumni presentations and so on there will be a bunch of like student like hackathons and groups so you might have heard of pen apps it's one of the largest student run hackathons in the us so we'll have like opportunities like that but we also do have some online options things like we have a slack group for cis msc for example and you can talk to people on slack if you like and facebook and linkedin and so on i'll mostly skip over this slide but i just provide a whole bunch of like resources for people to look at so depending on what you're interested in we have a whole bunch of different groups that you could get involved in so these can involve things like career services it can be the graduate student association we have country or region specific associations we have a bunch of other groups like for veterans for the lgbtq center for example the office of diversity and inclusion and so on as well I think a common question for a lot of people is uh, what do people do in the summer and people tend to do internships both for CIS, MSc and for MCIT. The rules for this are mentioned on the slide. I'll just mention it very briefly. I want to spend more time on your questions, but the rules are essentially you need to finish six courses and then you can do an internship in the summer. We also have this pretty unique option, something that we call academic field study. So what you can do for that is you could do a three month internship in the summer and follow that up with a three month like full time thing in fall and essentially get like a longer internship and you won't be taking any courses in fall in that case. So if that's something you're interested in, that's something that you can do as well. And sort of over the years, we've had people do internships at the large like tech companies like Google, Amazon, Meta, etc. A lot of the banks in the New York area, things like Goldman Sachs and so on some hedge funds and a bunch of like startups, both in Philly, in New York and in the Bay Area, for example. Uh, similar to this, where do people go after they graduate? I think I'd say a lot of people end up going to industry, but a good number of people continue their education either in a doctoral program or in some other program. So we get a lot of people who are interested, for example, in getting involved in research they start doing an independent study or a master's thesis with some faculty over here that helps them get into a top PhD program. So for example, I won't name the person to keep them anonymous, but there was a person who was very interested in research. They did some research with faculty over here and got admitted to Stanford for a PhD, for example. So there's a lot of opportunities like that, depending on what you're interested in doing. Oh, one thing I'll mention, so the link at the bottom of this slide, the career services keeps data on where people go after they graduate and this information is public so you can take a look at that for any of these programs if you'd like uh finally uh what are we looking for so as, as i said uh, we are looking for people with a strong background in terms of grades and coursework with strong scores if applicable uh in general we want we care about you as an applicant holistically. So there's no specific thing that will count for more or less. So if there's something interesting that you've done, some like leadership or community involvement or outreach that you've done, that will help us get a more complete picture of who you are. And that's something that I would encourage you to write about. And yeah, so I'll save a bunch of time for questions. So I see there are a bunch of questions here. So the first one that I see is, does MCIT only accept application from non-CS students, what is the undergrad major requirement? So it doesn't have to be non-CS. So I think the question with MCIT is, are you potentially overqualified for the program? So if you've done a whole bunch of CS coursework already, then, and let me just go back to the slides here. So if, for example, the courses that you see over here in terms of the core courses, if you think that, let's say, three or four of these courses are things that you've seen before, that's probably a sign that you are overqualified for MCIT and then CIS, MSc, or maybe something else might be a better fit. So they'll definitely look at your background and make sure that you are at the right level of preparation. Uh, let's see, let me get to the next one. Uh, so someone's asking, I'm an undergrad EE student. I haven't taken many CS courses, but some of our EE courses do include basic programming knowledge. Should I choose CIS or MCIT? Uh, so for that, I would say similar to what I said to the question earlier, which is 
take a look at like these six courses over here. That's for year one. If you feel that you've done two or three or maybe four of them, then CIS is a better fit. If you feel that you will benefit from taking a class like discrete math or intro to software development, then MCIT is a better fit. Cool. Let me get to the next one. So is someone with a CS minor, I've taken a bunch of computer of programming classes, but no course on system stuff eligible for CIS MSE. Yeah, I would say so. So we get sort of internally, our undergrads are eligible to apply for the CIS masters. The admission criteria is essentially intro programming, data structures, discrete math, either algorithms or theory of computation and two project courses. So if you have something close to that, you'd be perfectly eligible to apply for the CIS masters. If you feel that isn't the case, then MCIT would be a better fit. Cool. Uh, when will applications be released for round one? I think Christina, this is a better question for you. I don't remember the deadlines off the top of my head. I think it's yeah. sometime now-ish. Yes, if you apply by November 1, which was our early decision deadline, that means that we will get you your uh, decision by January 14th. So awesome. pretty soon. <laughs> Thanks, Christina. Yeah, I knew it was something around now because, yeah, I, I didn't remember the exact date. Thank you. Cool. Uh, next question. For CIS MSc, should applicants have advisors in mind or is it common to decide after the first semester? So for CIS MSc, you don't need an advisor. So what will happen is we will assign an advisor to you. Uh, if you want to do research with someone or independent study, you can do that like when you get here, when you take some of their classes and things like that. But it's not like a PhD where you need to say who your advisor or potential advisor is. So for all of the people in CIS MSc, Radian, who's the faculty coordinator, will be one of the advisors. I'll be the other advisor and then some of you will get a third maybe a fourth advisor as well uh when you say gre is optional does it mean that a student that submits their gre doesn't have any sort of an advantage over a student that does so i would say we treat it as neutrally as possible so we are not going to assume that if you don't have a gre you have a really bad gre or something like that because that would not be fair so the way we see it is if you have the gre that's one additional piece of information that we have if you don't we still have enough information from the rest of your application so whether you submit the gre or not it's uh like you don't need to submit a GRE to be admitted. And if you don't submit a GRE, that won't count negatively towards you. Uh, the next question, I think Christina, maybe you can like uh, correct me if I'm wrong on this, but the question was, if we apply to CIS for the early deadline and got rejected, can we reapply for the regular? I believe the answer is no for that. Um, I think that question, that's a tricky one. I think that is no. Um, if you're applying to another program, per, perhaps if you're applying to a master's program that is not computer and information science, then you could be considered. Sounds good. Thanks, Christina. Uh, let's see. So the next question is, I'm currently pursuing an integrated bachelor's and master's in computer science, non-US university. Am I eligible to apply for the CIS program? Yeah, you are eligible. So you don't, so having a master's this degree does not preclude you from getting another master's degree. So you can get a second or a third or a fourth master's degree if you are interested. Yes. Uh, let's see. The next question is, if I'm already enrolled in some master's program and have taken some CIS classes, can I still apply for CIS or CIT for my second master's degree? Uh in general, yes, it will depend on like what CIS classes you've taken, but similar to the question that was asked earlier, if you have enough of a CS background, you would be eligible for CIS. If you have uh, less of a background in CS, then CIT would be a better fit. But yeah, you'd definitely be eligible to apply. Uh, like I said, it doesn't matter if you already have a master's degree or not. Uh, the next question was, I've submitted my CV, but it doesn't show any coursework. Can I submit again? Yeah, I believe so. I think you need to email like admissions. Uh, is that right, Christina? 
Yes, please. If you have any questions about uploading a document or if you're having any troubles uploading or submitting your application, refer to your admission specialist. Um, unfortunately, we can't um, address these questions in today's session because we have faculty. So we want to answer your more pressing curriculum um, related questions. Thanks, Christina. And this question was answered already, so I'm going to skip it. Uh, the next question was GPA or research and industry work experience is weighted more during the consideration of an application. So I would say they're all weighted equally because for some people, like if you have completed your undergrad and don't have any work experience, we don't want to necessarily bias against you. If you've done some good classes or you come from a good university where you got good grades and have strong letters of recommendation. Conversely, there ha we have people who've been working in industry for a long time. So what they did, like, let's say five years ago may not be as relevant now. So that's really what I meant with saying we evaluate applications holistically. We are not because everyone is different, we don't have like a thing that says, oh, it's like 0.4 of the weight is on this and 0.6 of the weight is on something else and so on. So we'll just look at the application overall. Is there a lower chance of being accepted if we don't apply before the first deadline? No. So we know that we have two deadlines. Honestly, the main reason we have the two deadlines for CIS MSc is we get a lot of applicants. So we just need enough time to be able to read all the applicants and like put in the decisions and so on. So because we know there are two deadlines, we sort of budget for that and plan accordingly. So there is no advantage. So it's not like early decision if you're familiar with the undergrad like system in the US. So there's no advantage to applying for the first deadline or the second deadline. Uh, let's see. The next question is, I have an undergrad in automation and robotics engineering with computer science subjects majorly. I'm interested in AI. Am I eligible for CIS MSc? Yeah, I would believe so. So if you've taken classes, uh, let me just go back to the slide. So if you've taken classes on programming languages, data structures, discrete math, maybe some systems e-courses, you would certainly be eligible. I think based on what you wrote in the question, that seems pretty reasonable to me. Uh, for CIS, how does the thesis option work? So great question. So for people who are interested in doing research, you have an option to do a master's thesis. So the way this works is this will count as two courses towards your 10 course requirements. You'll take eight regular courses and then you'll take two courses that count as a thesis. For the thesis, you will identify a project advisor and a second person on the thesis who will be on your committee. We call them the reader. So the your committee will comprise of two faculty members and then you'll work with that faculty member and you'll do some research, you'll write up a thesis and then you'll have to do an oral presentation of the thesis, we call it the defense at the end. And then if the committee is happy with the work, you will have passed your thesis and satisfied the graduation requirement. But a thesis is not required for everyone. So it's an option. So if you like it, you're welcome to do it, but you don't have to do it. Uh, can we manage a full-time job and a full-time master's? Oh, I see, Christina, you're typing that already. So I'll let you type, but I'll just mention that like really briefly. So if, so I think there's two things here. So if you're an international student, you cannot work full-time and do a full-time master's at the same time because of like visa and immigration requirements. If you're a domestic student, it's allowed, but I would say it's a little bit harder to manage. So full-time job will be, let's say 40 hours a week, the full-time course load is three courses over here. Three courses tends to be pretty close to full-time. So doing something like 70, 80 hours per week, I think is unreasonable. I think most people who I know who are working full-time end up taking one or two classes. And even that tends to be pretty much on the heavier side of things. So doing three classes with a full-time job, I think would be too much. Uh, 